Okay, we're now live on Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn as well. Okay, we have about three minutes till the start of the program. For those of you who logged in a few minutes ago, um, we will be taking questions today. Uh, tech questions will be taken through the Q&A box. We encourage you to use that. Right now, I'm going to enable the thumbs up option so you can thumbs up or upvote a question that you want to see addressed with our panelists. We have two projects today. Uh, first project is the Tower Theater of Los Angeles. The second project is the Paramount Theater uh, of Oakland. And we will have time for questions at uh, hopefully about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes for questions. So we encourage you to use that Q&A box. Uh, but we'll start with some presentation of the projects. Both of these projects were design award winners for the 2022 California Preservation Design Awards. You can learn more about the design awards by visiting californiapreservation.org slash programs slash awards. Uh, we have three programs in this series of online programs and then followed by our online awards presentations, which would be the fourth of uh, the online programs. And then we also have two on-site programs, one in Pasadena, one in Oakland. You can find out more about these programs by visiting our website. Uh, we'll start here in about one minute here. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to today's program. My name is John Haber. I'm the Field Services Director for the California Preservation Foundation. Today's program will be in two, uh, we'll highlight two projects. But before we uh, describe, uh, introduce our speakers today, I just wanted to turn it over to my colleague for a few words and then we'll dive right into the projects. Hello, John. I was thinking you forgot to introduce Christine Madrid French. So uh, <laughs> here I am calling in from Orlando and just finishing up our yard work and cleanup from Hurricane Ian. I want to welcome everybody, uh, especially our special guest for today. This is the first program of three programs uh, free uh, for the public about uh, the winners from our recent California Preservation Awards. So these projects are some of the best in uh, California and exemplify historic preservation in the state. And so we wanted to share more detailed information about different projects. And if you go to our website, californiapreservation.org, you'll see what the two um, upcoming programs are going to be. But today is all about the magic of cinema, which is my favorite. And so we have with us two very special guests, uh, Deborah, uh, Gerald, and Devin Barnes from Gruen. And thank you also for your generous sponsorship. Uh, take it away, you two. Go ahead and let, tell us what uh, your project's about. All right. Uh, while Devin is queuing up the presentation, I'll uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Deborah Gerard. I'm a partner at Gruen Associates and the partner in charge for this project, which 
Um, I will just say the most collaborative project I've probably worked on in my 34 years at the firm. Um, and I think that's uh, telling about the nature of these types of historic uh, projects. I, I do wanna give a quick shout out to uh, Laura Jansen and Peyton Hall from Historic Resources Group, who I saw are on, as well as Mike Hume, who was a, a tremendous partner with us for the LA uh, Historic Theater Foundation. And, uh, and uh, both of them were, uh, both groups were really uh, beneficial in this. Uh, Devin, I will let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Devin Barnes. I um, project managed this project um, basically from when we got it um, handed over from Foster and Partners. But once again, like De Deborah was saying, it was a very collaborative uh, par partnership. Um, I'm going to run through a few slides here. I know there's a little bit of a delay, but um, this is a 19, it, this theater opened in 1927. It is downtown Los Angeles on Broadway. The architect was S. Charles Lee. It was his first um, solo theater commission. Um, and it was not, he did many theaters after this. Anybody wants to look that up, but um, what was special about this is that um, the narrow shape of the building made um, an interesting sequence uh, that we needed to uh, change up for retail. Uh, so we went from a lobby that had, uh, in a sense, light leaks um, or, or light blocks into the theater, and we needed to open that up uh, for retail. And, and we should probably uh, make the point that this was an adaptive reuse. This uh, building started out as a movie theater, and uh, this project was all about uh, turning it into an adaptive reuse um, to be a flag flagship for Apple. They don't call them stores. Uh, this is a flagship. And, uh, and so this project was really about both preserving the building but also what we needed to do to make it an appropriate use for retail, as Devin was just saying. Uh, there was much discovery and um, work that needed to be done, not only uh, with seismic uh, retrofits, uh, where many of the historic elements had to be taken down and we had a catalog and uh, track them while seismic upgrades happen. At the same time, we were having to deal with an accessibility issue to the upper uh, balcony levels. Um, here's a few pictures of just kind of before and after. Um, the flooring on the left of the original, of when we got it, uh, it had been uh, leveled out for raves and events. Uh, there was a raked floor below that. Uh, what we did for retail, we made it a flat uh, floor and added in, uh, you'll see underneath the tables here, uh, area registers. And I think the unique thing here is that this, the tables can be removed and the air registers can be uh, structurally walked upon. So this can still be a uh, event venue. Uh, and you'll see that there is still a screen in the same location where the original screen had been. A few more pictures also opening up uh, to 8th Street. Uh, it was important to get in some light and more connectivity to uh, the, the pedestrians. Uh, what's great about this is that people can walk by and, and, and peek in and this theater isn't hidden anymore. It can be part of uh, the community. Uh, now that that's opened up. More with accessibility, um, there's still seating in here for, uh, this is not only a waiting place uh, for the Genius Bar up at the top where you can make appointments with Apple, but if there is a venue, this is a seating area. If you are around town, you can stop in here and also kind of eat your lunch or drink your coffee and enjoy the view. Basically, what we took with the balcony, it was a very steep rake, and we made it into, in a sense, two levels. So an upper flat area up here has an amazing view uh, towards uh, the rest of the, the, the theater space. Some of the complications with the exterior, uh, just wanted to throw in some, some grungy pictures of how uh, the theater had really been run down and the amount of work uh, that we had to do with the terracotta on the exterior, 
uh, with the marquee that had been uh, cut back in the 70s, um, and then rework of electrical systems and waterproofing and damage that had been on the 8th Street canopy. Um, a lot of this work was done with uh, historic drawings that we had or old photos. And as you can see, some of the detail was very difficult to um, uh, imitate. We had to work with a lot of artists, art, artistic uh, subs to come up with um, what we see now um, at the marquee. More, this is on the 8th Street side opening up with the, the new lighting uh, that the wiring had to be brought up to code. Putting on the cap to the dome or to the tower that had been uh, removed during an earthquake. And some of the views along 8th Street with the billboards and uh, the use with the lighting uh, little details of, um, you know, placing the lights to get the, the beauty of the architecture really highlighted. And the blade sign, I just want to point out the blade sign. Uh, one of the, <laughs> the complications with this was that we needed to reclad it um, in place. We couldn't take it down. So structurally, we needed to maintain uh, the location and everything and, and do this on site, which some of the finishes reworking of the, the spacing of the, the lights uh, had to be done um, in the field. And just talking about this from a, I guess, a bigger, broader urban design perspective, you know, this, this theater, like um, many of the theaters along the historic uh, Broadway corridor here, um, you know, had had a heyday uh, when people were going to movies and watching movies, and that's not um, as high a demand right now. And so this uh, building had been vacant, as Devin mentioned, uh, used for an occasional rave. But really, when Apple came in and, and expressed an interest in locating their flagship right here, there was somewhat nothing going on in this neighborhood. And the power of Apple turned the tide for this uh, portion of the Broadway district and really got a lot of uh, people excited and interested that there was going to be a significant investment. And that just the, the story of that, the word of, or the rumor of that, uh, really created uh, quite a lot of additional investment in the area. And so while this is no longer used as a proper movie theater, uh, it, it is uh, still got theatrical aspects to it. Uh, the programming that Apple does inside of it honors or uh, uh, makes every effort to honor um, its history as uh, a movie theater and, and a movie theater that was um, not just a theater but, and not just a, an old theater, but had some significant firsts the first air conditioned movie theater, um, the first talkie west of the Mississippi. Um, and, and so this was really a, a kind of an important theater in its uh, day and, and bringing it back to be an important theater, an important community asset now. And really the rest of the neighborhood has uh, blossomed around this. And uh, through the course of doing this project, and I mentioned the collaboration with not only Historic Resources Group and the LA Historic Theater Foundation, uh, the LA Conservancy and the Office of Historic Resources, everyone really banded together to figure out what was critical, what, what was sacrosanct uh, that kept this being uh, itself and what what could be adapted to allow this to operate as a retail space. And some of the things that we were able to bring back to the exterior, the clock now works again. We're very uh, proud. That was no small effort. Uh, Devin mentioned that the cap was restored to the top of the clock tower. Um, so, so really we, we've left the building uh, better than, certainly better than it was uh, for decades. And uh, it's, it's really become uh, a great asset to this portion of Broadway. Thank you. 
great. Uh, thank you both. Um, we're now going to turn it over to Jackie Hogan's uh, project manager uh, on the um, Paramount Theater project, and she's going to cover this project in Oakland. Uh, Jackie, feel free to share your slides when you have a chance, and um, okay. we'll, we'll have some time for questions after both of these presentations. Okay, my name is Jackie Hogans, and I'm a project manager with McGinnis Chin Associates. Uh, we worked with the Paramount Theater as the owner and operator of the building, uh, and Jambolini Courtney Masonry Restoration as the general uh, restoration contractor. So this was the this is a photo of the theater in April of 2018. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this was. The original, these are some of the original photos of construction. Uh, the, uh, the middle upper photo is a photo of the mosaic tile being set. You know, everyone in Oakland is very proud of and very familiar with this, this theater. You know, it hosts graduation ceremonies, uh, citizenship ceremonies, in addition to many concerts. So it's really a, a hub of the community. So, uh, it's right on Broadway, for those who are familiar with Oakland. Uh, it had streetcars in the 40s, and in the 70s, when BART came, they changed the marquee. But that was really the only major change to the exterior. Uh, they did some post at Loma Prieta repairs to the, uh, to the interior and some ADA upgrades in the 90s. But otherwise, the exterior was, for the most part, as it was as it was designed, which is rare in an urban setting. Uh, and, but some of, the, some of the repairs had not necessarily stood the test of time. Uh, the building has been very well maintained. Uh, it's just that some of the repairs were, uh, some of it involved paint and some of the paint wasn't very UV stable. Uh, the terracotta, we saw some deterioration with the terracotta. But overall, you know, we did a JLG inspection in 2018, and we didn't see anything that was a major concern on the on the tie on the this polychrome mosaic, which is really the centerpiece of the theater in a lot of ways. It features over 70 different colors of glazed terracotta. We were able to acquire the uh, the, the setting plan from Gladding McBean which showed all of the different glazing colors and we use that to document the conditions. As you can see here, uh, we found lots of spalling of the glaze and less of the, terrac the terracotta itself, which was really fortunate because you, I don't know if, yeah, you can see some of these gold tiles here. And those were, when we did, uh, when we did, we did do some tile, anal uh, some tile and mortar analysis to determine if any of the deterioration was caused by poor glaze adhesion or anything of the sort and everything was fine. Uh, we had it to uh, we had a few lab, different labs test it and there was no problem with the composition or the of the tile or the mortar. But so we were very happy about that because we were concerned about you know matching all these different uh, tiles and because some of the materials that we would use back in 1930 we can't use in 2019 but the gold tiles themselves you see on the lower left hand corner those uh, the cost of those tiles is contingent upon the actual price of gold at the time so we wanted to make sure that we didn't have to replace very many of those at all fortunately we did not have to replace any of them um, this is a more close up before before and after. We did do some spot repair of the gold uh, the gold tiles. And most of the polychrome mosaic was easily matched based on the information we got from Gladding McBean, and we did a lot of mock-ups even before uh, even before we started doing work on on site, which was really helpful. Um, I'll go back. 
here. So the even though the polychrome mosaic is the you know, the centerpiece of the theater in so many ways, the that wasn't the problem. It was these uh, along the north and south elevations we have these maroon tiles, and we didn't have the best access to those during the 2018 survey. But what we when we actually had a pipe frame scaffold go up and we started sounding out and examining some of these tiles, we noticed that they were in really rough condition, uh, for lack of a better word. There were a lot of different repairs and a lot of those repairs had failed over, started to fail over time. Some of it was just UV. Uh, and then we also realized that the, the tiles were really set too close to each other. And because they were, on the north and south side of the building, the south side got a lot of heat, being that it was it's exposed. It's not real. It's kind of the tallest building on that side of the street, so it gets a lot of heat from the sun. And what we we it developed what we started calling friction spalling. Um, the thin joints were too thin. In some cases, they weren't pointed at all. And at during the course of a day or year or almost ninety years, these. The, the, the terracotta expanded and didn't have any, it didn't really have a lot of um, ways to expand and contract. So we had a lot of spalling and we couldn't tell it, we couldn't see from the ground level. We couldn't see very well from the JLG, but once we had the, uh, once we had the pipe frame up and we started doing a little bit more invasive investigation, we removed all the paint. I, the, on the upper left-hand corner, you see that they used a Portland cement patch to mimic the original condition, which most likely caused other problems. So we ended up having to do a full-scale survey of the, of the tile. You see on the left-hand side, this was one of the, 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 documents that we prepared and it showed that the chevron tile damage was really the problem and what we thought might have been cosmetic once we started sounding it out and you see on the lower left hand corner or sorry lower right hand corner that some of the terracotta was spalling and it went from being you know an estimate you know we had originally estimated maybe 50 or 60 tiles needed to re be replaced to this is an actual fall hazard uh, so that changed the course of this, this project completely. We retain, ended up retaining a structural engineering consultant because the exterior had never undergone a seismic upgrade or any sort of structural evaluation. Here's a little bit more about the, the friction spalling that we talked about. Once we started removing the tiles that were about to fall off the building, we noticed that some of the underlying concrete had spalled or just was never, um, never applied that well to begin with. You know, it's a, it's a reinforced concrete frame, but they applied a parge coat to, uh, to start installing the, the terracotta. Um, so what we ended up having to do is remove everything, even the things we weren't planning on removing, cataloging them, storing them on site and then reinstalling them all together. So um, we, uh, the, the right-hand side show the detail and an overview of the process of reinstalling and installing these tiles. We also install, uh, installed a grid of helical anchors to provide seismic reinforcement. So here's again that uh, Portland cement based repair on the left. And then we have the, on the right, the new and original tiles. You can see there's some differences there with the, um, you know, there was a, a wide range of this maroon and we were concerned about the, the um, color matching, but it ended up being really great. Vladdy McBean had like, it wasn't exact same color throughout, which we, we were expecting. So that allowed us to really um, to mimic the appearance as much as we could while increasing, improving the building's performance. Um, 
the blade sign up being another part of the project since we had to expand our scope of work. The blade sign was in pretty good shape. The management of the theater had planned to replace the bulbs, the glass, the incandescent bulbs with LED that were you know, very warm and it really were almost identical to the original lighting, but they figured since we had scaffolding up and we knew it was going to be there for about a year that we would strip the strip the um, the sign, patch up any areas of um, of deterioration and corrosion. And um, we we patched uh, we patched up some areas where holes had come through, we kind of made it we made it watertight. And then uh, right here you have the newly refurbished sign. We were able to restore, uh, remove and put all of the, the neon tubes, which were mostly original to the building. We stored those on site and reinstalled them when the work was, when all of the work was completed. And we, uh, we did the original red and white that the, that the theater had construction. So uh, that's a very brief summary of this process. Uh, this is uh, late 2020, once the scaffolding was removed. That's it. That's, uh, again, it's a long story, but worked out very well. Thank you so much, Jackie. That's a <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jackie. wonderful project. I will mention that this was very close to also getting a trustees award for excellence. So these two projects, uh, Tower uh, received a trustees award for excellence, uh, represent the best of the best. And it's just uh, just so happens that they're both theaters. So I think my colleague will take the first question and then I'll check the social media for any questions. Yeah, so Jackie, you could go ahead and stop share. So I wanted okay. to start with, um, Thanking everybody again for, uh, let me fix my screens now. And Jackie is calling in from London. So she gets the award for the furthest away from the headquarters. <laughs> um, I have just a comment from uh, someone in Oregon. In Oregon, the cost of asbestos removal was prohibitive. So why don't we just start with that? And maybe Deborah and Devin, you can talk about, did you have to address that at all in, in your project? I'm sure. I mean, you talked about it, but was so, it? So, yeah. yeah. So on this project and somewhere, we've got to add this photo to our slide deck, but we found in the basement something I have never seen other than in a Wiley e. Coyote uh, cartoon. There was a bag marked 50 pounds of asbestos in the basement. It was hysterical. Um, clearly that was literally removed. Um, there, there was a uh, remediation that needed to be done. They, um, you know, uh, blocked off the uh, theater for access and did the remediation in various stages. So yeah, that was uh, certainly something that was necessary. There was also some lead paint um, and uh, all of that was um, remediated. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Jackie? Was that something that was it cross prohibitive? I guess not, since you succeeded in this project. Oh, Jackie, you there? Oh, oh maybe she has. Yeah, but for some reason, my speakers went out. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I was just asking if asbestos was a was a big deal for your building. I would assume so. Um, asbestos. Well, we we were just on the exterior. Asbestos wasn't an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we had we had had the mortar and the grout tested during very early on in the process but what we weren't expecting was lead um, the glaze particularly for the maroon tiles ended up testing positive uh, for lead as lead-based paint or in the content was high enough in 1930s that we had to do a full abatement uh, the ironically enough the blade sign was just fine <laughs> uh, so that added that probably tripled the budget of the project and made us um, kind of expand things. Because we're, again, this was just going to be like a, you know, we weren't going to do the entire blade sign, but once we had everything scaffolded up and we had to have all this protection, we were able to, you know, we just decided to go with, go with the full, the full repair. <laughs> 
Interesting. And, and Christine, maybe um, I can expand a little bit more since that question sure. was specifically about cost. But you know, we had the benefit of having a client who uh, had some deeper pockets than most, and you know, the cost information is not. Well, so, some of it's public, but it's not supposed to be. So we won't repeat what whatever might be out there. But uh, you know, they didn't have an unlimited budget but they really had a desire to do the right thing. And they uh, uh, certainly had resources to stand behind that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and both them and the building owner, uh, Sharon Delajani, uh, wanted to do right by the building. And mm -hmm. so some of the things that would have been cost prohibitive to uh, someone of different means, uh, we were able to achieve here. Right, Jeff, I wanted to ask you uh, specifically, how long was that building abandoned? Because I grew up in Los Angeles and I never right. remember it being open. I, I don't remember exactly. Devin might uh, know the date, but I'm going to say 25, 30 years, um, something on that order. Yeah, I think it last last time it had a show was in the 80s. Yeah. Oh, that's when I graduated high school. So that makes sense, <laughs> doesn't it? Well, I did visit that building and I brought my dad, who is an old, old days Los Angeles uh, guy born in LA in the 30s. And he approves of that renovation. Hey. So I thought, you know, he's a tough audience, right? That he grew up uh, going on Broadway uh, to the theaters when they used to have the Christmas parades and everything. And there's so many good memories of that area of Los Angeles. It's really great to see this kind of project um, succeed. Uh, John, you want to do the next question? Yeah, I have a question for Jackie. Um, so my understanding, reading the application materials for this project, was that it was um, it was a partnership. Um, it was funded by uh, Athel McBean and William H. Crocker. Um, and yes. it's kind of it's interesting that the McBean family was involved in both funding it, but but also in the in the glazed terracotta. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, and, and this kind of follows on the questions that I have marked in the Q and A box: is who the artist of that um, most of that wonderful mosaic was? Was it Fluger, or was there somebody that designed the actual mosaic? Yeah, it's actually one of uh, one of the staff artists at Fluger's firm. You know, uh, Timothy Fluger was one of the primary, if not the primary uh, theater architect of the San Francisco Bay Area. He did the Castro, the Alameda. Uh, so it was a staff member. I can't recall his name specifically right now, but yeah, the, uh, the relationship between Apple McBean and, uh, and the theater is pretty interesting. I, I wonder if he just thought, hey, you know, my dad's got a terracotta company. I'm gonna. <laughs> why don't we just have a building with this terracotta? Because there's nothing. There's nothing else like it. Yeah, and, and I, it's homage to California and Californian artists. So it's. And and maybe as a follow up question to that, do the McBean the Gladding McBean Company is still an active uh, um, terracotta manufacturing facility here in California? What what did they think about the project? Were they excited to work on something that had a long legacy with? Oh, with yeah, their company absolutely they were yeah yeah they were absolutely yeah absolutely they were involved very early on because we knew we were going to have to replace some tile of the maroon tile it's not as much as we thought um so even very early on we started reaching out to them to get glaze matches and providing any of the documentation that they had um, they had they were able to provide some of the um, the the setting the tile setting plan so we were able to use that. That helped us as we were documenting. And it was just a really great looking document to have. So That's great to hear. Chris, you have yes. something? I do. We're just going to go right back and forth. So this one is for uh, the Tower Theater. Was the Tower Theater project reviewed by the local Historic Preservation Commission? And if so, were there any challenges or concerns with granting entitlements? So um, we did go in front of the uh, uh, Historic Commission and the day we went, Apple reached a billion dollars in net revenue or whatever the <laughs> measure was. And, and so it, it was uh, only telling because uh, there was someone in the audience who said, hey, you guys have enough money, you know, more money than God, you should you know, do everything, there should be no budgetary uh, limitations. And um, so it, uh, uh, it, that was just interesting timing, but uh, the 
the uh, building was reviewed. It was supported by staff uh, at the Office of Historic Resources and uh, was approved. And, and like I said in the beginning, there was a lot of collaboration. I think um, the team did a lot of things properly in terms of engaging well before we had plans uh, set to be submitted. Uh, we engaged with the Office of Historic Resources, the LA Conservancy, the Historic Theater Foundation as a little mini task force. And so before everything was committed in the client's mind, we kind of tossed things in front of them to discuss what was gonna be successful, what wasn't, where the pressure points were. There were plenty of pressure points and uh, we did not do everything that was originally uh, uh, put forward, but it, it, I really believe very strongly in that as a process and it absolutely made the end product better. And uh, just doing everything that architects want isn't always uh, really what's best for uh, the results. And, and I think it really takes the collaboration and the pushback to get to a better place. And so by the time we went in, for, in front of the Cultural Heritage, Com Heritage Commission, um, we had support for the, uh, what was being proposed and uh, it was successful. I just want to know there there was still a budget so <laughs> yes there was there was still we still had to work on things and yeah um I don't want to dwell on things that might have been left out but um you know there are plans in the future to continue um um some of the work great and and on on that question of the budget um there was a question about ta whether or not tax credits were utilized for this project no, they were not. Okay, and uh, yeah. Jackie, with the Paramount, was was that a tax credit project or no? It was not. No. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Devin. Yeah, I think you were going to say something oh, else. Yeah. I just wanted to mention how Deborah had mentioned this is Apple is not the owner of the building. It is um, it is a tenant in the building. Okay. Yeah. Um, and a question that. I had, and it looks like one of the audience members also had, was about the art glass or stained glass um, window at the front of the theater. Um, it has a prominent sort of spot in one of your photographs, and it's really stunning to see. I'm wondering if you could comment on on the work done to that, um, and how what kind, sort of condition was it in when you discovered it? It isn't actually too far off from um, what you see now. I think um, what helps is that the inside is now <laughs> cleaned up uh, so much. It did have some broken pieces that uh, the restoration group uh, did a beautiful job of uh, um, uh, cleaning up and mimicking. Um, it, it wasn't in that bad of condition and it came out pretty easily and uh, it was restored off site. Uh, and then uh, it was simply cleaned up. We were thinking that the yellowness in the glass um, was, uh, you know, I don't know, nicotine tint after years, but it was actually part of the stained glass. Uh, so uh, it isn't too far off from the original. I think it is a lot about that lobby is now uh, so cleaned up and it it's sets it off a little bit in a different tone. Just exactly. amazing. It, yeah, it's yeah. amazing it stayed so intact, you know, given that it was vacant for so long. You know, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like it inside. Um, so regarding the tower, did you substitute materials or did you use original materials to reconstruct that tower cap at, at the at the theater? The tower cap is GFRC or yeah. RFP. RFP. So it was um it was Re fully reconstructed. Um, it is structurally now adhered to the top and uh, will not fall off. Um, it had to be, we definitely had to look at uh, a lot of the different images. The original drawings didn't, you know, give us specific uh, dimensions. And then what you might not see from uh, the street level, but there are designs with apples and fruit and uh, little kind of cornucopia type pieces that we we literally had to work with our artists on carving that out. And I think it um, it really adds to it um, something that you don't see every day on it. 
but but the original was terracotta and so a lot of work went into making sure that we were um, as close to the original appearance as we possibly could be now i i can't help but ask you jackie about the gold leaf on the uh on the terracotta and um its impact on the expense of the project but um also you know you've mentioned that some of this terracotta had problems with uh, uv damage and spalling and so forth um so was it you know did you have to replace the type of glazing i think you mentioned that you may have replaced it with more of a uv resistant um you know did the chemical composition of some of these glazings change in order to stand up better to the test of time um mainly on the the um the maroon tiles just because you know we that original glaze did have lead. So you know, we can't use lead. So we ended up having to do, make a, uh, working with gliding and being making a lot of uh, masks for the replication. For the mosaic tiles with, with all the different polychromes, we were working with Edison coatings and we ended up getting some really great color matches with them. Uh, so that worked out very well. And the gold, we ended up we ended up working with them for a custom match. We were going to do gold leaf, but then the gold leaf manufacturer in Italy stopped making that specific shade. Mm. So uh, fortunately we have a consistent repair program, uh, repair product throughout. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll ask one more question before turning it over to Chris, but um, about the, inside of the theater. Now, this project was entirely about the facade and the marquee, but um, can you maybe comment about the condition of the inside? I, I was there maybe four or five years ago and it looked stunning on the inside. So I don't know if things have changed since then, but. Yeah, it's actually incredible. They, I, I believe that the when the building became, it was saved by the city, you know, uh, urban disinvestment. Uh, it was pretty close to just being shuttered, but the city, uh, city uh, acquired it in the early 70s. Uh, you know, it's the home of the Oakland Symphony Orchestra. And uh, so, the, and then right around that same time it became a National Historic Landmark. And the city and a lot of donors put in a lot of money at the time to imp uh, improve the interior for um, uh, acoustically. And then again, after Loma Prieta, there was a, another repair program mainly to deal with the tier, uh, you know, earthquake damage. And there was also uh, ADA compliance at that time too. So they lost some seats, uh, but the built the, uh, so there hasn't been a lot done since then, but there hasn't been a need to do it. Mm -hmm. Everything's in great condition, uh, really good condition. And they've just recently now started opening it back up for tours. They have public tours and uh, you know, there's, their concerts again now. They had to stop for a little bit, but they're back on now. Great. I'm glad to hear that. I'll I'll be sure to come back for a public tour at some point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got to get out of the out of the rooms we're in, uh, John. Uh, so I'm gonna roll right into landmark listing, and I'll start with Deborah and Devin. But same question for both teams. Uh, were was the building already landmarked listed? Was any part of the interior space uh, part of the listing, like character defining features, were there any challenges with that? And do both of these buildings still retain their landmark listing? Deborah and Devin, you first. Yes, it was. It was already listed. Um, it had. It has many character defining features. Um, I think most of them, you know, with an adaptive reuse uh, where there's um, metals and stone that we did not use, uh, we have it stored on site. We have some kind of hidden secret uh, storage locations behind uh, some of the cells, displays and walls. Uh, we have a projector room that is uh, not accessible anymore. Uh, that we stored a lot of uh, the metals and, and stone that was not used. And this is really where Historic Resources Group um, was our, our conscience. And they kept us, uh, uh, they, they always kept that um, 
that uh, issue of making sure that we're not uh, doing anything adverse to uh, the historic status of the project uh, with the things we did. So, you know, as, as Peyton drilled into our heads, uh, you, you can't, uh, you, you can do a couple of things. You can't do too many things until you, you've somehow uh, eroded what was special about it. So we really made sure to look at the things that were most critical and most important and focused on, on those things for where um, I'll say maybe some deviations were, were made. Um, but, but really uh, HRG kept us mindful of, uh, you know, not, not uh, taking for granted uh, the, the uh, essence and the materiality of the space, not trying to use our architect uh, sensibilities to improve things, that that wasn't really what was uh, appropriate, but rather to honor what was there and uh, just do the, the least that we needed to do to uh, make this function for the way that we needed it to function. That's wonderful. It says a lot about teamwork. And how about you, Jackie, uh, at your site? Uh, well, the building was a, uh, it was a National Historic Landmark and it had been since the 70s. So that was, uh, you know, it was a non-starter that we weren't going to impact that. Originally because the project was always considered to be a maintenance, maintenance project. So we worked directly with the city of Oakland and their preservation planning department. And uh, there were never really any objections to what we were doing or any concerns or you know the character defining features the facade itself is a character defining feature we weren't changing uh, and we didn't change the appearance of the building we just uh, did so mm -hmm. basically considered a repair project so right it was great for us and i guess yeah, yeah more of the tower with the changes yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so i have a question from linkedin actually uh, um and this is about the the fixtures and features and artifacts of these spaces. So um, the question really uh, was directed at the tower, but I might have a question for Jackie too later. But, but um, with with th things like the projectors and other items within the uh, the building, the question was really uh, what what is being done with those? Do you have them stored away in case you know at some point in the future there's a the theater space there again? And what's the plan long term plan for those? items. Yeah, so um, I'll mention why the projection room is not accessible, but because we had to add an elevator, actually we added two elevators to the building to make it um, accessible for um, uh, people to, to get to the balcony. Uh, and the space was very narrow. There were limited places where we could uh, get access to that elevator. And that access to the elevator ended up cutting off the space to get to the projection room. It was a, a, a little on the dicey side to begin with, and, and there just wasn't enough space to do both. So the projection room is there. You can get to it, but in order to get to it, you have to go onto the roof and across to the clock tower and down into the projection room. Um, so it, it's not accessible to normal uh, daily use, but we did preserve everything that was there, including the windows uh, in that space. Really? So it is left untouched. We did remove the, uh, the film medium that was in there uh, because that was considered a uh, fire hazard by the uh, fire marshal. Um, but everything else is, is left. The, the uh, equipment is left, the reels, the toilet, we cleaned it. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the window ports from the theater side are still uh, visible, but they're um, blocked off. And then the windows are still accessible on the inside. So we, we tried to keep it all so that if it ever really wanted to be uh, reversed, that it could be, minus the fact that we didn't have a good way to get up in there. And, uh, and Devin already mentioned there were um, materials that, uh, uh, you know, original stone that was removed and, and not reused or some uh, metal work that was removed and not reused and that we kept it all within the building. But we did one more thing that I was pretty happy with, which is um, this was the whole contracting community that contributed to this. So I want to give them all a shout out. 
but uh, there were scrolls um, provided and lots of annotation to find all the secret hiding spots in the building so that it wasn't just something that we knew, but that someone could actually come in and uh, find things and retrace our steps uh, long after we're gone. I love that, like treasure map. Uh, that's pretty fun. Treasure funny. hunt, for sure. <laughs> Except for the that's asbestos, right. that was really I know, right? We don't want to uncover that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'll take this next question. It's from Judy in Palm Springs. Hello, Judy. I'm going to be in Palm Springs very soon. I'm signing books on October 15th at the Modernism Week. Uh, she says, I'm on the board of the 1920s Historic Plaza Theater there. You plan to restore the theater. They're raising funds. What are some ideas of who to approach for grants or funds? I'm not sure that Deborah or Devin or Jackie, this is in your wheelhouse because you had um, some, you know, well-suited uh, people behind the projects. But um, she's asking, Judy's acting, is there someone I could call for ideas and should said suggestions? Any help is appreciated. So if you have an idea, you could put it in the chat. Or Deborah, Devin, Jackie, do you have any ideas where? People might go right for historic theaters. It's really a challenge. I would say definitely to talk first, you know, start with your local historic preservation uh, advocates and then with people at the city of Palm Springs and then just start going out from there. And there's quite a few uh, groups, I would say advocacy groups that are where theater people are connected to each other. They're quite excited about preserving historic theaters. Uh, so that would be uh, something. And then Judy, you can always send me an email. It's uh, chris at californiapreservation.org, uh, C-H-R-I-S. And maybe I can meet with you when I'm in Palm Springs so we could talk about it. John, you have any ideas for Judy? I think you went over most of them. Um, I, I will say that the theater groups are very good at fundraising, um, surprisingly good uh, compared to other fundraising efforts for preservation. So everybody loves to save a good theater because they're just beautiful spaces. So it makes it easier, um, but it is a, they're challenging spaces to to rehab and find new uses for. So um, that's why we wanted to highlight these two projects today because mm -hmm. uh, we knew there were challenges. We just wanted to hear more about them. So. Um, but there was a question, did, did, should I take a question, Chris, or how are we doing on time yeah, here? You're, you're, there's one more for McBean, you were going to take that. Yeah, I'll take the McBean question. So Jackie, you sort of described it a little bit earlier, um, working with McBean, uh, Gliding McBean, but can you maybe give us a little more information on where McBean, Gliding McBean is today? And if people want to learn more about them, uh, maybe we'll paste a link in the chat box while you're talking here, but, uh, yeah, tell us about Gliding McBean. Yes, so Gladding McBean, at the time of at the time of the construction of the Paramount Theater, Gladding McBean was one of it was the largest and most prominent of many terracotta manufacturers, not just in the United States, but in California. Because of consolidations and just changes in architectural taste, terracotta is not uh, not as widely manufactured as it used to be. So on the West Coast, Gladding McBean's located in Auburn, California, not too far from Sacramento. Um, I know that, that before COVID, they had tours of the of the site. It's worth it. That's worth a visit as well. Uh, and that's uh, so. Yeah, they're still very active making uh, making terracotta. They were incredibly helpful with this work. Obviously, you know, it was a. Uh, it's not very often you get to go back, you know, a project that has this, like the, a personal connection to the McBean family too. So uh, we've been working with them for a long time. So it's great to have a project like this for us. Thank you. Yeah, um, a couple of years ago, CPF did a tour of the factory, which was such a special opportunity and it's, it's very rarely available. They don't usually do public tours, but sometimes they help out nonprofits and so forth. So if you ever see, if you ever have a chance to um, take a tour of, Glad of the Gladding McBean facility in Lincoln, California, don't pass it up. Even if you have to fly up to from LA or wherever else, because it's definitely worth the opportunity. It's a, uh, it's like frozen in time. You know, it's just an amazing place. Um, the, I, I pasted in the uh, chat box a link to the Gladney McBean website. Um, a lot of buildings in the Bay, it, maybe Jackie, you can uh, confirm this, but a lot of buildings down here in downtown San Francisco have Gladney McBean terracotta. It's one of only two 
I think, remaining active factories in the country that produce terracotta yeah. still. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I would say that I, I don't know of, I think I maybe know of two or three buildings that I personally worked on in San Francisco that were not constructed from Vladimir McBean. Uh, we were not clad with Vladimir McBean terracotta. They had a lot of, um, you know, if you know the Rust Building in San Francisco, in downtown San Francisco, they had a patented system uh, where they, you know, it was, I can't remember the name of it. I think it might, might've been Granite Tech. It was like a mass production of this glaze that um, that was supposed to mimic building stone, and so they were just they were at, you know they were at the, in the late 1920s, early 1930s. They're really at the forefront of like really pushing the boundaries of what terracotta could do, and you know the, the Paramount's just another another example of that. So yeah, it's uh, it's glad I'm being on the west coast in Boston Valley on the east coast. Great. So everyone had used to, you know, that was a huge, huge industry at one point. Well, I think we're all out of questions. Um, Chris, did you have anything else or? No, I think we should wrap up and thank, I want to thank Jebra, Jeffin, and Jackie again for all your expertise and your time. I know that everybody in the audience appreciated it. And I did post in the chat. Uh, two links for historical societies that worked exclusively with theaters. And there's one more, and I could not remember the name of it, but just go ahead and uh, Google some of those things and you'll find it. So I wanted to thank you all for all your work. The, the two buildings are fantastic. And it was a real honor for us here at California Preservation Foundation to recognize your work and all the teamwork that goes behind saving historic building, like the tower in Paramount. So thank you very much for, for coming today. And uh, I wanted to let everybody know that we have two more programs coming up in our California Preservation Awards pro series of programs. And the reason we have these for free out here for everybody is we want to share this expertise and in, in, in this education in historic preservation. If you're so inclined, you can visit our website and donate to support some of our free programs. It's CaliforniaPreservation.org. And you can even get to see me and John in person at two receptions that we're planning, one in Oakland and one in Pasadena. And apparently John will be making appearances at both receptions. Uh, that's October 13th and October 20th. And you don't want to miss that. We're featuring a Bernard Maybeck house in Oakland and a Buff and Hensman house in Pasadena. So go ahead and go back to our website and find out more about that information. And John, you want to close it out? Uh, yeah, yeah, the only thing I'll mention here is um, if you'd like to let us know how you uh, how today's program went, feel free to go to CaliforniaPreservation.org slash E. And our next program, free public program for this series is on the 18th, and the following one is on the 25th. The next one is on the San Francisco Waterfront Resiliency Plan, as well as the San Francisco or the past South Pasadena ADU guidelines. So um, important uh, documents that help preservation planning. And then the following uh, program, part three, will cover hotels. So the proper hotel and the Coronado, Hotel Del Cor Coronado in, in San Diego. Um, so, that. yeah. So we're looking forward to the rest of the series. And I wanted to say a special thank you to our panelists today. And um, especially Jackie, who's all the way in London, you know. <laughs> so thank you for... Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Have a great day, right. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. It was fun.